Being as we are with baptism and concluding with the Lord's table, man, you can't get any better than this. And all of the, sim the symbolism that it involves, everything we do today shows the death and the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Did y'all realize that? And we have today one who is from among us who realized that she had yet, she was playing church, but she was not actually part of the church. And she gave her heart to Christ and has trusted the Lord. Katie, come on. Mrs. Katie Willis called me on the phone, actually her husband did, and talked to me about her need to follow the Lord in baptism because she had, that day that she spoke with me, trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. And we worked out the best time for her to be baptized, and today is it. I'm so proud of her. This is not an easy decision once you've been a part of the church for years and years and years, it's not an easy decision. Some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. But she was brave and she was obedient and God's going to bless her for it. I promise you that. Katie, Word of God tells us in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. Who's your Lord? Jesus Christ. Amen, Jesus Christ. Let's make this thing work right. Yeah, we got you, girl. All right. And upon your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me pray as David comes to the platform. Beloved Father, we thank you. You're great. You're good. You're wonderful. This is a great and glorious day. We magnify your name and ask you, Father, for you to be glorified in our time of worship and celebration. In Jesus' name, amen. Great to see you this morning. Glad you're here. We're in Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to talk this morning about our great salvation. I'm going to read some verses of Scripture. I've decided as I was seated there just now that we'll read this responsively. That is, I'll read a verse and then you will read a verse. Then I will read a verse and then you will read a verse. So you may want to refer to the Scripture that's on the screen in order to be sure you're reading in the same translation and it all sounds good. If you can't see it, that's all right. Read whatever translation you have, even if it's another language. That's fine by me, you know. That's all good. Let's stand to our feet, ladies and gentlemen. Word of God says this to us, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Father, your word is true. Your word is without any shape, form, or fashion of error. And we thank you for speaking to us this morning. And we pray that you will make very clear your word. Through Jesus Christ I ask it. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to look this morning at two perspectives. 
about salvation. We're going to look at our perspective. We're going to look at God's perspective. It's like a church building uh, that uh, my church in South Carolina, my what was our home church there in South Carolina, had built about the same time we built this one here in 1967. But they had back in the back this really neat room over on this side over here. And uh, that room had a two-way mirror in it. And when you looked at it, you saw yourself, it reflected back at you. Which is what happens when we see salvation. It reflects back at us in some sense. And I'll show you that in a moment. But then, if you turn the light on, inside that room, you could see everything that was going on in there. You could see another perspective. You could see the perspective those from inside that room had looking back out towards you. That's what we're going to look at, our perspective and God's perspective this morning. Here's our perspective. This is what the Bible teaches us. He forgave us. That's what I see. So turn to somebody and just tell them, I'm forgiven. You see that? Isn't that beautiful? This is the truth of God's Word for every one of us. This is what God teaches us. I want to share with you three quick biblical definitions of forgiveness. <clears throat> and I want you to see these. Number one is to release from an obligation that is release from a debt. Number two is to restore a broken relationship. And then thirdly, forgiveness means to remove an offense. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, for us on a personal level, that's always a very difficult thing for us to actually enact in our lives. The, whole, the Old Testament has some very lovely images of forgiveness. Uh, one of them in Jeremiah 31 verse 34, you can look it up later. Let me just tell you what it says right now. In Jeremiah 31 in verse 34, the Word of God tells us when he talks about sin and he looks at our sin. And folks, ladies and gentlemen, hear me on this. We're all sinners, aren't we? Okay? And so when the Lord looks at our sin, uh, this is what he says, I will remember them no more. When he's talking about your sins, he says, I will remember. It's not that he forgets them. God is anything but forgetful. He's not forgetful. He chooses not to remember our sin. Isn't that great? That's what he does. But it's more than that because you see this same, this same word of God tells us in Micah chapter 7 verses 18 and 19 that not only does he remember them no more, the Bible says he takes our sins and he places our sins in the depths of the sea. Isn't that wonderful? Well, let me just give you a third picture of that. In Psalm 103, the Bible says, I think it's in verse 12, I believe it is, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. And this is what God has done. This is what forgiveness means for us. Now let me, let me just go into detail on that for just a brief few moments as of, if I can. Ephesians 4.32 tells us that we're to forgive one another just as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. And this is, these are the details of how and why and all the wherefores of God's forgiveness of us. The first thing God did was, in order to forgive us, He made us aware of our, of our sin nature. The fact that we are sinners. I'm still amazed when I speak to people and I try to impress this on them that there are still people who resist the idea that they are sinners. Many of them say to me, I'm just as good as anyone else. You sure are. <laughs> you sure are. You're as good as I am. Guess what I am? Guess what God said about me? That's right. Folks, this is key and this is important for us that we have to become aware of the fact that we are sinners. And God makes us aware that we have incurred a sin debt that we cannot pay. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
Everybody has. And it's not by works of righteousness which we have done. So you can try to be religious and it doesn't measure up. And you can try to be kind and forgiving and it doesn't measure up. I was on my way to uh, uh, Lima a few years ago, one of these trips that I went by myself down there. I was going to do a missions conference and um, seated next to me was a man from uh, somewhere above one of the nations up north of India and uh, he told me as, as we talked and his English was very very good um, you know as we had this conversation I said well tell me what religion do you follow he said I'm a Jain and I said really and so I noticed this man of the Jain faith as we talked and we compared and I said, so what is it that you must do in order to, to be forgiven? And he says, oh, well, we have to do this and do that and do the other. And he named all these works that required in his faith in order for him to be able to achieve the state of, of uh, perfection that eventually he wanted to achieve. Folks, you can try it all day long. You can, you can be the best uh, men, forgive me for pointing y'all out, deacon in this church. But it's not good enough. As someone put on their Facebook page recently, you can be a method Christian. You can learn the part. And you can live the part and act out the part, but it doesn't do you any good whatsoever. You have incurred a debt that you cannot pay. So God offers us an alternative. He said, I'll pay your debt through Christ Jesus, death on the cross. I'll do it. So he sent his son Jesus, and I'll come back to that again. And Jesus died for your sin on the cross. He died for Drew's sin, and Makita's sin, and Bryce's sin, and Scott's sin, and Ed's, and Dawn's, and Miss Wanda's, and Anita's. And he died for little Charlie over there, sound asleep. Died for his sin! He said, that boy hadn't sinned. No, we, the nature's there. I think he sinned yesterday, man. He started yelling like life was coming to an end. And all he wanted was somebody to pick him up, little rascal. So what do we have to do? Christ, God has paid the price through Jesus. We receive this by faith. We put our trust. We believe Jesus died for us. We receive it, <clears throat> excuse me, through repentance from sin. I shared this with a man. His name was James. <clears throat> and I shared this with him. And he was my friend, and we'd known each other for, for uh, several years, and a number of years rather, I won't say several at that point, but we had known one another for a number of years. And he said, no, 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 no. I said, why not? Well, he liked the forgiveness part, and he was willing to say, oh, Jesus, forgive me. But you know what he wasn't willing to do? He wasn't willing to turn away from sin. And he said, I've got too much to lose. Too much to lose. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, what shall it profit a man or a woman, parentheses, mine, if we gain the whole world, yet lose our soul? What does it profit us? When God forgives us, he releases us from that sin debt, that obligation. He fully pardons us and he restores a broken relationship, makes us part of the family. Isn't that great? I'm forgiven. This is God's perspective though. I redeemed you. That's what God says. 
Now again, I want to go to the Old Testament quickly about this and, and share with you from the Old Testament definition. This, this means to purchase. The word redemption means to purchase. One of my friends was robbed, a nice, a nice briefcase that he had. We're in the city of Arequipa. This wasn't too long after we lived there, so this would have been about 1991. And they robbed him. And he came to me, he says, man, you won't believe it. They, they stole my briefcase. There I was in an internet uh, uh, place, and, and uh, some guy walks by and grabs my briefcase and walks away with it. I said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go redeem it. I said, you going what? He said, I know where it is. You can't go down there. You're a gringo. But I can go down there, and I'm going to go redeem it. And he went down in there, and he walked through this particular part of the city, uh, which truly um, wouldn't be wise for me to go in there. And he walked through that area, and he found it seated in a booth. And he said, that's mine. How much? And the guy said, this much money. And he bought it back. And you're saying, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe God did that for me. I can't believe God paid the price that it cost to purchase me. But he did it. It means to deliver, to release. There's a picture. It's, it's happening. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of the date. If Dee McDermott were here, she could tell you the date. But it's, it's called Yom Kippur. And I haven't looked it up recently to remember the date. But it's right about now is Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And what they did in the Old Testament in the Day of Atonement, they, when they offered the sacrifice, it was a goat. And they brought two goats up. And one of the goats was to be the sacrifice. But over the other goat, they would lay their hands on that goat and they would confess the sins of the nation, the national sins over that goat. And all that, that would be true about sinfulness before Almighty God, they confessed over that goat. And then they would take that goat out into the wilderness and they would go all the way out into the wilderness. The men who had that goat, the priests, Levites who had that goat, and they would release that goat out in the wilderness and send it away. And this is the word redeemed that we have here. God sent our sins away. You say, what if that sorry goat came back to the camp? Sometimes it would try to. Then they would grab that goat if it turned around to follow them back into the camp and they would throw it down into a ravine so it could never come back to the camp and be sure that it wouldn't do that. It means to pay the ransom price. You see, this is the Old Testament design. Uh, don't turn there, just listen to me from Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11. The Word of God says this, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it, the blood, to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Ladies and gentlemen, God designed by the shedding of blood for our sins to be paid for. Innocent blood, not just any blood. Leviticus 1.3 tells us that it must be spotless blood. And all of that pointed to what Jesus did on the cross. And in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 19 and all the way through 28, there is a picture of the importance of the blood of Jesus Christ in 922 says without the shedding of blood there is no remission so you try to present your works to God but your works are not works of shed blood you try to present your moral attitude before God one man said to me of course I'm going to heaven. I've never broken a single one of the Ten Commandments. And I said, you just did. <laughs> but he said, I'm telling you, I've never sinned. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. 
Only by the blood can our sins be atoned for. Only by the blood, ladies and gentlemen. So guess what the New Testament teaches us? Romans 3.24, your, your sins have been released. They've been released away from you. And then the New Testament definition also says that you have been bought out of the slave market. Never, never, never to be sold again. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And it means to pay the ransom price. You remember my friend I just told you about? This is what it means for us. To pay the ransom price. And God took the, the blood of Jesus, the precious blood of Jesus, the lamb without spot. You were not redeemed with gold and with silver or with corruptible things, but with the lamb, with the blood of Jesus, that spotless blood, the Lord Jesus paid that price for you. You see... If you hadn't caught that picture yet, we're not talking about pricking your finger and dripping some blood down. On there, my blood is sufficient. The demand is death. The wages of sin is death. And that's the demand from Almighty God for our sins. And that's far too high for us to pay. So God sent His Son And they called him Jesus. And he came to love, heal, and forgive. And he went to the cross and he bought your pardon there on the cross. And there's an empty grave now because God raised him from the dead. God paid the price through Jesus Christ. And we have to receive the payment as though we made it. It's the payment. It's the only acceptable payment there is. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what he says. And that is our only access to Almighty God. That is our only access to forgiveness. To let God buy us out of the slave market. To let God buy us out of the life of sin. From the sin master. Let God purchase us. That's what this table is about. That's what this moment is about. We're celebrating. We already celebrated the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This baptism we celebrated this morning was a symbol of the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the cup and the bread is a symbol of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, of redemption that we have been bought. We have been bought. We have been bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bread is His body which is given for us. The requirements are threefold. To participate and celebrate in this, you must have placed your complete faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the only means to be saved. Two, you must have identified with Jesus through New Testament baptism, which happens after, not before you have been saved. And three, you must be in fellowship with both the Lord Jesus and His church. We're going to have two invitations this morning. Hear me clearly about this. The first invitation is for you and me 
those who say we have repented and trusted Christ, if you need to renew your fellowship with him before we receive these elements, then this invitation is your time to renew your fellowship. And I would ask you to be an encouragement to the church that you come and kneel at these steps to do that. And you make that fresh encounter happen here so people will know that you're serious before God about these things. It will encourage the rest of us. If you've not yet trusted Christ and repented of your sin, please wait. Please refrain from participating. If you're not walking in fellowship with the Lord Jesus, please hold off. We'll have another invitation in a moment. So I'm going to ask our, our worship team to come as we those that will be participating in this part, for us to be able to have this first invitation time. I'll make myself available to also be here to pray with anyone who wants to pray. This is only, this part of the invitation is only for you and for me. Stand to your feet, please. Father, speak to our hearts. Father, make it clear. Make it abundantly clear. I ask you in Jesus' name. Speak, Lord made as he celebrated with the disciples you know what he said he said I've been looking forward to this that's a share of paraphrase but that's pretty much what he said y'all since we decided a few weeks ago that we were going to celebrate uh, the deacons and I talking uh, brother Larry I think you mentioned something about fifth Sunday my brother Dale, you mentioned something about going out this afternoon. I said, let's do it. I'd been looking forward to it and looking for the time, and it just helped me, helped prompt my mind at that moment. I've been looking forward to this morning. It's exciting. Listen to the Word of God. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and, and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me
Father in heaven, we observe this time when you gave your body, your life, for our salvation. And Father, we just thank you so much for the grace that you have shown us. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now remember, this symbolizes, symbolizes the body of Christ. It's not the body, it's a symbol. Take and eat. The Bible says, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, <clears throat> this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. before your throne of grace uh, 
we just come to you having confessed our sins, Lord, and that we ask that through your blood, the horrible light, the death that you had to suffer, Lord, but through this, we're all been, are able to be redeemed and we're going to spend eternity with you, Father, in Jesus' name. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of our Lord Jesus Christ. an interesting story this past week related to the Lord's table. Some people call it communion. Some call it the Lord's Supper. The name you want to give it's fine by me. But in this particular story a woman wanted to partake but the pastor made it clear that unless she were baptized as a believer after you come to the Lord, not before, that you should not, and she'd not been baptized as a believer. Her sister was there in the church, and her sister was most unhappy with the pastor at first. And then, one of these times, the woman turned to her sister and said, is he saying I can't take this? And she said, that's exactly what he's saying. Well, about two or three weeks passed by and the woman came and said, it's bothered me ever since. And I need to be baptized as a believer in Christ Jesus. And there in that office, she prayed and she established that time that she needed to trust the Lord and follow him in believer's baptism. If you've never trusted Christ, you witnessed this morning the symbols of his death and his resurrection. He offers you forgiveness, full, complete, without reservation forgiveness of whatever you've done, whatever. And you can call on him. The Bible teaches that you can ask him. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And you can do that this morning. Father, during this time, you're speaking to some who need to confess that they're separated from you. I pray you'll hear them. They're going to tell you that they're turning from their sin. I pray that you'll hear them. They're going to ask that you save them and be Lord of their lives through Jesus Christ. And I pray that you hear them. Then I pray you give them the conviction by the Holy Spirit that impulse in their heart that they publicly confess Christ. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.